and said, Peace be still. And the winds obeyed him. And they said, What manner of what? What manner of man is this? I've never understood how preachers could read the Gospels and think he was like us because he's nothing. He sleeps in a hurricane. You walk the floor if the light bill ain't paid. He sleeps in a hurricane. He's not like you. He's not like you. And he comes to have dominion even over the great enemy, which is what? What's the great enemy? Death. And so he comes to a little girl and he raises her and she's only been dead for an hour or so and he raises her from the dead. And then he moves on and he comes to a boy who'd been dead a day and they were ready to bury him and he stops the funeral procession and then he puts that behind him and then he comes to a man that's been dead four days. There's no doubt now, everything is lost, all hope is lost and he says, Lazarus come forth and he exercised dominion over death itself. Jesus came to right the wrong. Jesus came to undo what had been done through the fall. He came as a man and he proved it in his earth walk. He showed you what man was supposed to be. That's what a man is. A man walks on water. A man talks to the wind. A man can take loaves and fishes in his hand and bless it and God will multiply it. A man can speak to dead things. A man can live. A man can move. A man has authority. Humans, on the other hand, are at best hopeless and helpless. A man. He came to right the wrong. So now, after these three and a half years, he bows his knee in the gritty gravel of the Garden of Gethsemane. And with great agonizing, he says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I want you to learn this. I want you to learn it. Don't just hear it, learn it. What God wanted from a man was to choose him and to trust him. That's all God wants from you. Choose him and trust him. He'll take it from there. All you got to do in any situation, I choose you and I trust you. I'm going to leave the consequences up to you. I choose you and I trust you. You'll take it from here. I choose you and I trust you. And in the garden, Jesus chooses, not my will, but thy will be done. In the garden, Adam says what? Not your will, mine be done. In the garden, he tried to rescue. He tried to go in after the woman because he loved her. He could no longer reach her. She went in first. He saw what happened. He tried to go in and help her. He tried to save her. He could not for he found out he was as helpless as she was. What truth this is. What amazing revelation. Jesus chose him and then he trusted him. Now Jesus would lay everything down in three dimensions. Three times the cup passes. That represents spirit, soul, and body. So Jesus laid down all that he was spiritually and took up all that we were spiritually. Jesus laid all that he was down mentally in the soul realm, took up all that we were, and he laid down what he was in body and took up what we were in body, which was sickness and disease. And so we can say there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus drank the cup of the Father's wrath, of the Father's indignation, and everything that Adam's transgression had produced was in that cup, and Jesus drank it all. And the reason you get a full communion cup is because he drank a full cup, not of communion, but of your corruption. See, he drank your corruption so you could get a cup of communion with the Father. See, he drank your corruption so he could give you the cup of communion full to the full and overflowing with his own blood. Jesus fully identified with me in all of my death and all of my curse. He was made a curse, Galatians 3.13. He suffered my death. He was made sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Hebrews 7, 26 in the King James Version said, he became us. And for three days and three nights, God treated him as though he were me. God judicially imputed to Jesus my sin. Jesus never sinned, had no sin, did no sin, knew no sin, but God judicially by faith took my sin and put it in Christ, put who I was and put it on Christ, put my sickness in Christ, put my death, my poverty and all that I was. He put it all on Christ. Jesus bore all. He was wounded for your transgression. He was bruised for your iniquity. The chastisement of your peace was upon him. And with this 
stripes you're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Therefore the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He laid it on him. He put all of your sins, all of your curse, all of your corruption, and all of your death. He bore it all. It is this message on the death side. Jesus bore it all. Took all of my death and all of my sin, all of my corruption. He was made a curse, Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. It is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. The truth is, Jesus took all of my death and my curse. He took it all. Therefore, since he took it, it was imputed to him, it was punished and dealt with, then it's no longer mine. It's no longer mine. I rejoice now, these things are no longer mine. Praise God, it's no longer mine. He bore mine. So that, and we rejoice that God raised him from the dead, and when God raised him from the dead, the death he was in was not his, it was yours. Raised him out of the lowest pit, wasn't his pit, it was your pit. It wasn't his death, it was yours. It wasn't his sin, it was yours. It wasn't his fear, it was yours. We were the reason he hung on that tree. Love would not let us go. God so loved the world that he gave. That's the reason Jesus hung on that tree. God raised Jesus from the dead. And when he raised him from the dead, he gave every man opportunity to receive his own salvation. Now, God treated Jesus as though he were you for three days and three nights so that from this point on when you receive Jesus, then he gives power to become the sons of God. He can treat you as though you were him. You see, everything that was yours became his, so everything that's his can become yours. That's called the great exchange. And so now, instead of me being full of sin, I'm full of his righteousness. Now, this is where my salvation begins. You've got five realms of life, spiritual, mental, physical, social, financial. So in the spiritual arena, the first thing that happens when you get saved, God causes your spirit, man, to be born again. You are washed, you are cleansed, your sins are removed, born on the tree, taken out of you, and he puts in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are made righteous by faith. You are born again. At that moment, you are blood washed, you are redeemed, you are cleansed, you are made right, you are accepted in the beloved, and you become a child of God just as sure as when a baby comes from the mother's womb and is embraced. God, then you come from the womb of the Spirit. He embraces you. You are his. He becomes your father. You're born again. You must be born again. And beloved, now are we the sons of God. And from that moment on, everything spiritually that God has is yours. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with how many? All. What kind of blessings? All. Spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. So I just want to encourage you this morning. The fruit of the Spirit's yours. The gifts of the Spirit are yours. The blood is yours. Baptism of the Holy Ghost is yours. Praise God. The prayer ministry of Jesus is yours. The right of the high priest at the right hand of God interceding is yours. It all belongs to you. You are spiritually rich. It's all yours. But is it yours in heart? You must possess it. I am rich spiritually. I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm redeemed and saved, filled and free, blessed, anointed, appointed. I am righteous in Christ. He has blessed me with all blessings and it's mine. And I've been in this covenant enough to know it belongs to me. It's mine. Mine in heart. It's mine. And therefore, you can't take it from me. You can't talk me out of it. And no preacher with a silk suit and a slick tie and a silken tongue can talk me out of it. That won't work anymore. I have not gotten this by going to church. I didn't get this by just listening to me. I got it through the revelation of Jesus. I know this is my salvation. I'm saved, praise God. I'm healed, praise God. I'm free, praise God. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Greater is He that's in me. Praise God, He's in me. Praise God, He's in me. Praise God, He's in me. Praise God. He's in me. And when it becomes personal, it becomes powerful. It's yours. Ephesians 1.13, your own salvation. You heard this word of your salvation. But salvation don't just stop there. So if you need anything spiritually today, if you need instruction, edification, you need equipping, you need baptism, anointing, whatever you need, it's yours. Now possess it with your heart. 
This has been my experience with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know, I grew up in old time classical Pentecost, and boy, we used to go through it to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You had to go through and pray through to get through. You remember them days, those of you that were in that, boy, they would take you and you get on, that, on your knees at that altar and they would beat you in the back and holler glory and they would tell you to hold on, let loose, here comes the rain, here comes the fire. And I found it to be quite the confusing experience myself. Quite the confusing experience. Because I've got an analytical mind, I'm thinking, well, if it rains and then here comes fire, the rain will put out the fire. So, And then one lady just stopped and said, what you need to do, boys, put up your lightning rods. And I just looked at her because I was only 17. I said, I'm sorry, I don't have any lightning rods. She said, no, your hands. She said, your hands are lightning rods. I said, they are? <coughs> well, you just got saved. They are? I didn't know that. You mean if I put my hands up, God might strike me, but that might not be a good thing. Getting struck with lightning is not good. <laughs> but I, I found this to be true. If you will just receive it with your heart. Receive it with your heart. I've had a lot of people through the years come up to me and say this. Now, Pastor John, I see what you're saying. It belongs to me, doesn't it? Said, yes, ma'am, it does. And this one lady, oh, I could think of dozens, I could tell you testimonies here. And she said, put your hands on me then. I'll be filled with the Holy Ghost and speak with tongues. Just put your hands on me. Let's do it now. It's mine. I did and she did. I did she did. But see, it was hers in heart. See, a lot of people want to begin to talk in tongues and then believe they got something. You got the cart before the horse. So you have to embrace your salvation. All right, now that's the spiritual arena. Need anything spiritually, it's yours. But make it yours in heart. See, Caleb said, it's mine in heart. All right. Mental realm. What belongs to you in the mental realm is the mind of Christ and rest. You have a right to be delivered because Jesus wore a crown of thorns. You have a right to be delivered from fear, anxiety, phobias, torment, and all of that that goes under the curse is put away by Jesus wearing a crown of thorns. So therefore, I have a right to the spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. The crown he wore, the blood he shed, gives me the right to believe I have the mind of Christ. Therefore, my soul realm is prospering. It's mine in heart, and my mind is not growing weaker. I'm not getting forgetful. I'm not growing dim, but my mind is increasing through the mind of Christ in Jesus' name. Now, you got a choice to make right here because they tell you, doctors will tell you, Scientists will tell you at 40, your brain begins to change in its physiology. At 50, things begin to not operate the same way they did. When you get to be 60, it doesn't operate the same way. There's some tissue loss. There's some mass loss in your brain. And it's just natural that you should grow dim as you grow old. That's natural. But you're not natural. You're born again. I'm prophesying over you. You're supernatural. And it is, it is supernatural that you have the mind of Christ and your mind be clear as a bell every day you live and your mind be sharp and you have the wisdom of God and the favor of God on your thoughts and you're thinking heaven's thoughts and you ain't thinking lack, you're thinking blessing, you ain't thinking sickness, you're thinking life, you ain't thinking death, you're thinking blessing and favor and I'll live and not die. Praise God, i got another thought and my mind is renewed. My helmet of salvation is on and my mind has been restored and the mind of Christ is operating in me. Therefore, the intelligence level and what I have and what I know and what I can operate in is growing rather than diminishing. You have the spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. Well, let me ask you this. Is it yours in heart? Is it yours in heart? Now, see, that won't work just because I preach it. And it won't work just because he said it because if it did, all of us would have it because he said it in 2 Timothy 1, 7. It will only work for the man that believes it. So what do you believe about your mind? What do you believe about your soul realm? What do you believe about your mind, your personality? What do you believe? Talk about your sorrow. No, he bore my sorrow. Talk about your grief. Surely he borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. There's a time to grieve and a sorrow, but at some point you've got to let him bear it. There's no need to live sorrowful. 
There's no need to live full of grief and woe and anxiety. All of that is done. You don't have, let not your heart be troubled. You don't have to be full of anxiety. It's your salvation. You have the right to the power of God in your soul realm. It belongs to you. But is it yours in heart? Remember what Caleb said? Now, 45 years ago, I walked this land and it was mine in heart. And I told Moses it was mine. If you read what we read, you can go further. He will say, Moses said, as you live, saith the Lord, this land that you put your foot on, it is yours because you followed the Lord your God. So is it yours in heart? Today, I have the mind of Christ. I have a thought of rest. I have a thought of favor. Praise God. His thoughts are my thoughts. But you've got to make it yours. Just to hear it and do nothing about it is no different than saying twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are. It's not going to matter. Are you listening? This is the seed of abundance. This is how the child moves into being a man and this is how the air begins to operate. In the physical arena, from the top of our head to the soles of our feet to the end of our fingers, I call you healed today. I call you healed in your body. And I don't speak as an arrogant man, but I do speak as a healed man today. With tears running down my face this morning, early on the carport in the quiet, as I was taking communion, meditating the stripes of Jesus, I saw my Savior bleed. I saw that blood run freely, and I was able to just drink and draw from that communion cup and thank God from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet to the end of my fingers. Today, my body is healed. I am healed, praise God. For by whose stripes you were healed and with whose stripes you are healed and himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness and carried our disease are you healed is it yours in heart today it belongs to you it's yours purchased by blood quickened by spirit according to his word you are the healed of the Lord and I've used this for years Psalms 105 37 said there was not one feeble one among their tribe now, they constituted a city about the size of St. Louis, Missouri. It was two to three million people. That's a good number of people. And when they came out of Egypt, you could look high and low, and you could go all through the camp to the oldest to the youngest, and you could not find one feeble one among their tribes. So I believe there's not one feeble one here. Your youth is renewed. Your body is quickened. You're strengthened in the name of Jesus. I'm believing, God, that you have a quickening power in you. Romans 8, 11, if the spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And that quickening is where the life is. And you can enjoy that. You can engage it. You can receive it. You are quickened today. You're the healed of the Lord by whose stripes you're healed. It's yours now. It's your salvation. Now work out your own salvation. Now, I've noticed this about praying for people, and I've prayed for a lot of sick people through the years. The people that come and say, pray for me, I'm sick, don't ever get much help. But I've had a lot of people, after they've listened and learned, they come to me and said, now, pastor, you agree with me, you lay hands on me, because I believe I'm the healed of the Lord. You lay hands on me, and I've laid hands on those people, and it's just as easy to get them healed as it was those other people to get the Holy Ghost. The struggle's over when it's yours in heart. See, the struggle is only when you're trying to get something you don't know it's yours. That's where the struggle is. You don't know it's yours. It's your salvation. Praise God. It's your salvation. Now, in the social arena, he delivered me, and praise God. I've had some wonderful opportunities to be bitter. I've had some amazing opportunities to be mad. I've had some wonderful opportunities to hate people to be frustrated, to be aggravated, to be agitated. I've had some wonderful opportunities to just absolutely just stomp my foot and West Texas cuss. Hmm. Everybody look this way. I know none of y'all would do that, but I've been tempted. Just West Texas cuss. You ever been out in West Texas? When they cuss, they just, what they say, a cuss a blue streak. They just cuss a blue streak. I don't know exactly what that means, but I get the idea. Cuss a blue streak. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Who hadn't had some problems dealing with people? If you're a church member, you've had problems with preacher. If you're a preacher, you had problems with church people. If you've been married, you had problems. If you ain't been married, you had problems. If you got a boss, you got a problem. 
If you've had kids, if you had kids, I mean, praise God, my kids got through their teen years and kept their teeth. Praise God. Praise God. None of you feel... Mm. There, there were a few days I could feel that coming up on my hands. So, mm. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Just, oh, God, help me. Just be peaceful. This is your precious beloved daughter. Don't do... Okay. There were a few days. There were a few days. Anthony never had a mouth. Christy, big mouth. Talk back. Little, pint-sized, a lot of spunk. I ain't going to do that. I don't want to. I don't care what you want. <laughs> you're getting ready to do what I tell you to do or else. I ain't going to do that. You know what happens. So we've all had opportunity to hate, to be angry, to be mad, to be bitter. Yeah. Yeah. I've had opportunity to hate Lancaster. I've had good opportunity just to be mad and cry of my injustice and speak of the atrocity of what happened to me. But Lord, I bless them today. I bless them today. I bless them today. Why? Because he's blessing me. He forgives me. So therefore, the only thing I know to do is take what he's given and give it to them. What a marvelous, what a wonderful, what a beautiful opportunity to just receive what's yours. Forgiveness is yours. Now, here's what we've been taught. You know, we're not going to make things right with people until we make things right. Now, I'm going to help you with this. Don't wait on what you can do to make things right. Jesus came to right the wrong. And no one at the foot of the cross asked him for forgiveness. Did they? Did anyone look up at him and say, man, hey, I'm sorry. We didn't mean to be so rough on you. We went a little too far. Please forgive us. Anybody do that? No, the ones that had done that to him, they mocked him, they beat him, they were scourging him, they were angry with him, and they continued to pound on him and continued to hurt him and beat him, and no one asked forgiveness. What did he do? What did he do? Father, forgive. Did they ask? Did they ask? No, but he did that. That's the way love operates. Love is proactive, not reactive. He did not wait for them to say, oh, please, please forgive me, Jesus, for plucking your beard. He said, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. See, if you're going to wait on them to apologize, you, they might be dead and gone before they ever make things right. But this salvation tells me, go ahead and let the cross make things right and be right with them whether they're right with you or not. Doesn't make any difference. This has set people free from all the burden and the bondage and the blindness and the bitterness that they carry because you don't have to wait. He did not wait and he is my example and I'm in agreement with his prayer and he prayed, Father, forgive them. And when God heard that prayer, he just said, okay, I'll forgive the world. And he wiped the trespass clean. And now the thing that damns a man in the new covenant is unbelief. Sin's power is broken. We just don't believe that. It's not a man's sin that condemns him now. It's his unbelief. Whoever believeth not shall be damned. And he that believeth not is condemned already, for he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Preaching men's sins won't help them, but preaching faith will if men will believe. Now they got a choice. Let them believe. Let them choose. But you learn to be reconciled whether they're reconciled or not. You don't wait on them to ask you. You don't wait on an apology. Nobody owes me anything. January the 2nd of this year, on a Friday, I went to the courthouse, and, and the very man that spearheaded all of that against me looked right up at the high-setting judge in this county. The high-setting judge in this county, and he looked at me, and I'm standing there, I'll never forget this as long as I live. I've got my black suit on. I've got a chiffon shirt, a tie that matches, and I'm standing there before the judge. And the man that spearheaded all of that against me, these were his words. Your Honor, I approve this man for the grand jury.
But now here's the good news. See, I don't have to go to him afterwards and say, listen, man, I really need you to forgive me for everything I've said about you and everything I've talked about you. I, I need you to forgive me. No, see, we dealt with that back in 2011. See, he, that was already dealt with. That's already dealt with. Actually, it was dealt with 2,000 years ago. See, is it your salvation? Is forgiveness yours in heart? Is it yours? I've forgiven my brothers and sisters. I've forgiven those that walked out. I've forgiven those that turned around. I've forgiven them. There's nothing to hold against them anymore. Let it go. It won't help you. This is your salvation. And in your salvation is the freedom to be reconciled to people. Jesus did not wait for them to ask forgiveness. My son, will he come? I believe he will. What if he don't? Praise God. Are you listening? Praise God. You don't praise God because he's here and you don't praise God because he's not here. You praise God, period. My salvation is bigger than what he did. My salvation is bigger than an estrangement. And no matter what he does or what he says, that boy is my boy. That boy is my son. And that boy is blessed because I keep putting the blessing on him. And I'm just standing between him and God saying, Father, I thank you that you bring peace and reconciliation on my son and his family. And I bless them. And that's all I'll say. Why? Because it's mine in heart. When did that happen? 2,000 years ago when a bleeding Savior said, forgive them. Nobody asked him to forgive, but he did it anyway. See, somehow we got this misguided idea that people got to come beg your forgiveness to get it. No, no. You're a fool to do it that way because you're harboring all this bitterness in you and it's festering in you and it's making you sick. No, 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 no. This is my salvation. My salvation lets me be free from people. Hallelujah. My salvation sets me free from people. Praise God I'm free from people today. Praise God we're free from what they do and don't do, say and don't say. We're free from them in Jesus' name. And every day that goes by, I'm much more difficult to offend and to hurt than I used to be. I used to get my feelings hurt at church all the time, not so much anymore. I used to get angry at the drop of a hat. I carried my hat and dropped it all the time. I don't do that anymore. I put my hat up. I don't wear that hat anymore. That is your salvation. Now let me ask you this. Look this way. Is it yours in heart? Is it yours in heart? So you got to embrace it. In this last room, financially, all my needs met, favor and blessing, the multiplying of my seed sown, increase, prosperity, favor, all of that already belongs to me. It already belongs to me. It's mine. It's already mine. I have it. I'm not trying to get it. Now, where's it going to show up first? It won't show up first in your checkbook. It's not going to show up first in your savings account, your 401k or your IRA. Where's it going to show up? Caleb said it was mine in heart. And it manifested, and when it fully manifested, he ended up in a big house. He ended up on top of a mountain. He ended up uh, pioneering a tremendous lineage of faith that came through him, but it all started in his heart. See, people say, I'm prosperous. Well, how do you know? Well, I got $48,000 in the bank. And see, you can be dirt poor and have $48,000 in the bank. You can be dirt poor and have $4.8 million in the bank. You can be dirt poor and have $4.8 billion in the bank. Just listen to some of these folk talk on TV that are millionaires and billionaires. Listen to them for 20 minutes and you realize they're bankrupt on about every level. But oh, this favor is mine in heart. Let's just shout this morning. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. My father owns the cattle on a thousand hill. My father feeds the sparrow. He clothes the lily and he is my father. He provides for me. He protects me. He gives me blessing. He gives me favor. He increases me. He, he makes sure I have what I need when I need it. It's mine in heart and I'm not waiting for it to be. It is mine in heart. See, you have to embrace your own salvation. It's yours. Now, let's understand. This doesn't belong to anybody else. It belongs to you. Now, what you do with it is not up to anybody else. It's up to you. What you do with it, it's mine. Praise God. It's mine in heart. Let me tell you a little story. And I'll close with this. This will be financial, and this, this will help us in the financial arena. 
You know, denominations have a tendency to send young men to places that are dead. They won't give you a good church because you might hurt it. <laughs> it is true. They'll send you to dead church because they figure you can't do no worse than the last three fellows they had. If it's dead, it's dead. So my denomination in 1983 sent me to a church, and it wasn't dead, but boy, financially, it was a wreck and a mess. Now, how, when we got up there and took the little U-Haul, Teresa and I drove the U-Haul up to this town. It's about 100 miles outside of Roanoke in the western part of the state of Virginia and got up there, and a couple of the brethren come to help us unload. And uh, I'm 21, she's 18. And they look at her, and when she was 18, she looked like she was about 16. And I had carried something in the house, and I come back around the corner, and I heard these two men talking, and I just stopped because I wanted to hear what they had to say. You know, I became an eavesdropper, Right? And the one man said, what do you think about this preacher? And the old fellow said, I don't know, but they sure are sending them young up here these days. He said, you look at his wife? I don't even know if it's legal. <laughs> you reckon they're legal? That's the exact word. You reckon they're legal? Hmm. And then the other man laughed. He said, yeah, if they send us anybody any younger, we have to put the preacher in the nursery. What a confidence builder on your first day. Unloading your furniture. Put the preacher in the nursery. <laughs> How much experience you got, boy? Well, I preached a few times. You ever pastored? No. Oh, gee. Thank you, Lord, for sending this. Thanks. Hmm. <laughs> so here we sit down. It's my first experience with the books. I had a good earthly father who was a good businessman. and We sat down and looked over the church books. And my dad looked, and we got out all the notices, and we had a, a three mortgages on a little piece of property and a little house joined together, three mortgages. And we had a double default, which means it's two behind, and then another double default and another double default. And I looked at my dad, and I said, what's a double default? And he said, son, you're six mortgage payments behind. They're going to come take your church from you. I said, they are? When you're young and dumb, you don't know. I said, they are? He scared me. Oh, they are? Yeah, boy, six, that's bad. And so my father, and of course, this wasn't a lot of money to him at that moment. He said, all right, that, he figured it out. But he said, I'm just going to go ahead and give you $2,600 out of my savings account. And you can pay this and start fresh. I said, no, 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 don't do that. I need to learn to do this for myself. I need to learn to do this. He said, are you sure? I said, I'm sure as I can be. And I looked at him and I said this to my earthly father. We were sitting at this little desk and I smiled and said, Dad, birds have bills, but they keep singing. <laughs> and he didn't think that was funny. He didn't crack a smile. He just looked at me and shook his head. He thought, dumb kid ain't got enough sense to know he's in trouble. And so I got up the first Sunday with that disaster we owed an oil bill and a back bill and this bill and the time I went through town met everybody we owed everybody and I got up first Sunday and said praise God I want to give you an announcement today our needs are met praise God finances flow into this place and they got just about as excited as you did just then And one old fellow leaned over to his wife and said, Ethel, he's new. He'll learn. Ain't no money here. He'll learn. He'll learn. Ain't no money here. <laughs> Ethel, I give him credit for his gumption, but that boy's young and dumb. Ain't no money here. <laughs> and they were selling hot dogs on the corner downtown every Friday to make the budget. And a little lady walked up to me after the Sunday service, and she said, uh, Will you be there Friday morning to chop the onions? I said, no, ma'am. <laughs> she said, well, why not? I said, well, because I'm not coming down there at 7 o'clock in the morning to chop onions. She said, well, why not? I said, well, because God meets my need. 
And I said, now what I will do, I'm come over here and pray Friday and believe God and I'm going to be in the church praying, but nah, I'm not going to go down there with you. She said, you mean to think you can pray money in? I said, I think whatever I ask my father, he'll bring it to me out. She said, that ain't going to do a bit of good. What's the matter with you? So I let them go on for about a month and they, the ladies went down there. It was causing strife because I wouldn't come down there. and I didn't want Teresa down there. And everywhere I went, Hey, you pastor in the hot dog church. You're the hot dog pastor. <laughs> now, what I, want you, what I want you to understand is we're born again, spirit filled. They're not saying, hey, you're the church. You pastor that church where people get healed. You pastor that church where people get the Holy Ghost. You pastor that church where people are anointed and their lives are changed. No, you make good hot dogs. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be known for making good hot dogs. I want to be known for something supernatural, something powerful, the name of Jesus to be glorified, exalted in mighty power where men can come far and wide and find glory in who he is, not because we make good hot dogs or good spaghetti suppers or good sweet potato pie. <laughs> and so I... I got up on a Sunday, and you know when I'm young and dumb, I didn't know how to work with people, just young and dumb. And I said, now, okay, hot dog sales are out. They are off. We're done. And three of the ladies come up to me and said, you can't do that. I said, I can? Why not? She said, well, because we need this money to make it. I said, sister, you ain't making it with the money. We broke Ain't no money here. We're broke with doing this. She said, if you take that out, we'll go under. And I'm looking at God, and he's smiling. I'm saying, no, we won't. Tell you what I'll do. Ladies, meet me up here at 9 o'clock on Friday, and we'll fast lunch, and we'll pray from 9 to 3 for the finances of the church. And not one of them ladies showed up. Now, I appreciate the heart to go down there and work, but it's more important to engage Father in the covenant than it is to go down there and do something like that. Now, later on, once we got, and I'll give you the rest of the story in a second, let's jump ahead four years right before I left there, we had several days where we made hot dogs. We went down there and gave them away and told everybody, here's a hot dog and a Pepsi, bless you in Jesus' name. If you need any prayer, just let us know. We're here to help you. You don't want any money? No. Just want to bless you. We're giving them away. Now, if you want to go down there and give food away, I'll do that with you. But I ain't going to sell it. I ain't going to put a, a chicken sacrificed to the most high God on a rotisserie to make this church work. We got to do that. Let's just close it and go home. I don't want no Krispy Kreme donut box up there. No old coat for rummage. It ain't rummage. It ain't donuts. And it ain't sick chicken sacrificed to Jehovah that make this church go. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider. He'll bless us. He'll provide for us. Or I'd just rather go on home. If he ain't right, then just let it go. Give some hot dogs away. Oh, we gave several hundred away. Praise God. Give them away. Here's a hot dog and a Pepsi. Bag of chips on top of that, all paid for. Compliments of El Shaddai. <laughs> Compliments of El Shaddai, the Most High God. Hmm. We, <laughs> that was in July. And on the first Sunday of 1984, which was a Sunday, January 1st was a Sunday, my precious Baptist grandfather came, sat on the front row. Michael, my cousin, had him. That was the last time he got to be in church with me, 1984. Pappy John was there. And I got up, and I smiled, and I said, folks, got an announcement. All the bills are paid. The back mortgages are paid. And I've been in here praying, and I, they all told me, you're going to have to go do this and do that, and I didn't go do that. And I said, and I want, I want to shout this morning. This church right now, we have got 83 cents in the bank. <laughs> we had 83 cents in our checking account. 83 cents. And here's the funny thing. They gave me a standing ovation. Because that's the first time they'd ever started a year where they didn't know everybody and his uncle and his cousin. And we had 83 cents and all the bills paid and all the needs met, seed in the ground, and had 83 cents to the good. 
Now, here's what I want you to see. I'm rich. I had a church give me a standing ovation. I'm rich. Got 83 cents, but I'm rich. I'm a rich man. 83 cents. It ain't the money. When you wake up, it ain't the money. It's not the money that makes you rich. It's what's yours in heart. My needs were met. I had a God that sent me to Independence, Virginia. I had a God that supplied my need. I had a God that was bigger than a hot dog sale. I had a God that wouldn't let me fail. I had a God who smiled on me. I had a God whose hand was on me and I felt 25 feet tall. I had a God who would not leave me, forsake me, nor fail me. No matter where he sent me, he'd provide for me. I have a God. 83 cent may sound pitiful looking back on it. Are you kidding me? Well, see, here's the difference. Now, listen to this. This is sad. I'm about to tell you. If we had 83 cents today, man, I would be depressed and discouraged. I'd be singing the blues. I'd be ready to quit. Now, let me ask you a question. I was just a kid back then. How come 83 cents worked then and 83 cents won't work now? Hmm? What's the problem? He ain't changed. What's the problem? It's what's in your heart. It's what's in your heart. What was in my heart then? I got a God that can't fail me. I got a God. My Father won't fail me. Praise God. My Father won't fail me. That's in my heart. Now I'm going, my God, we got a $3,800 mortgage payment coming up, and I got this bill, and we got that light bill, and the light bill goes up in the summertime. I got to pay for the grass this week. And see the difference? You know what? Just that shift in heart take you from a rich man to a poor man. Just that shift in heart. Got 83 cent, praising God, shouting, people standing up, clapping, standing up here today, and we got more than that, praise God. Our needs are met, and sometimes it's really tight here, but we praise God, and yet my heart is heavy because of finances here. What's the problem? It's a heart problem. Heart problem. Your issues are heart issues. I just hard to get over how happy I was that day. Never forget it. My grandfather came to the house, a little parsonage there. Teresa fixed chicken. We sat down. We ate together. You know, Pappy John had on a little bow tie. We, we laughed. We cut up. He hugged me and said, Johnny boy, I'm proud of you. I got in the car with Michael and drove back to Princeton, West Virginia. And what a day. And, and went, went back to church that night. And we had a good offering that morning. Started out the new year with everything paid. And I thought to myself, you're such a good God. You're faithful. And I'm standing here today. And there have been moments when I'm like, where are you? What, what, where, what's, what are you doing? And, but then and now. Should I not be more mature now than then? Should I not be more excited now than then? The answer lies in the heart. It was mine in heart. What's yours in heart today? Stand with me in Jesus' name. See, the problem's not the money, it's the heart. Heart's right. Tithing, offering flows. Heart's right. Money's not the issue, God's the issue. Heart's wrong, money becomes the issue. Hmm. Please hear this morning. Please hear my heart. Please hear. The issue is not the money, it's the heart. Caleb walked around in a, in a dry, dead old wilderness for 40 years. Opportunity every day to complain, watching people die on the right and left. Several people a day had to die for 40 years in order to equal that 2 million people that passed away. Down to about 20 people, he looks at Caleb and said, well, there's only 20 of us left. What do you think? Caleb says, it's mine and heart. I don't care can't do anything about what they've done. It's mine and heart. Get down to them too. They go into the promised land. Caleb said, it's mine and heart. It's mine and heart. It's mine and heart. Now listen to the word of the Lord. Listen to what he says. Even when you heard the gospel, even the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. See, it's your salvation. Wrongs to you. What you do with it's up to you. It don't automatically work. You have to engage it. You have to employ it. You have to exercise yourself to godliness. You have to just draw and drink from it. You have to learn. Praise God. Look at it one more time. Mind and heart. Last scripture, please. Let's look at it. You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And believe in your heart God raises him from the dead. You shall be saved. 
For with the heart, man believes to righteousness. With the heart, man believes to healing. With the heart, man believes to prosperity. With the heart, man believes to favor. With the heart, man believes to blessing. With the heart, man believes whatever it is unto, man believes with his heart. And the first place it's going to manifest is in your mouth. So you're looking for a manifestation in your checkbook, but you don't got one in your mouth. You know what you got in your mouth? A bunch of mess. You know what you got in your mouth? A bunch of shortage. You know what's in your mouth? A bunch of shortage. And you know why that's in your mouth? Because you got shortage in your heart. I wish somebody helped me preach. I think some of you forgot the first part of the message. You're already at the lunch table. <laughs> Woo, praise God. The first, you want a manifestation? I'm waiting on a manifestation. You know where the first manifestation is going to be? It's going to be in your mouth. And when you get to where you just can't say anything, but, whoo, God's meeting my knee. God is faithful. I'm blessed and highly favored in the city, in the field. He blesses me. I'm blessed. El Shaddai is my father. Hallelujah. Oh, and then pretty soon, it won't be long until it starts releasing. And then pretty soon, Again, in a flow, and then that flow becomes a fruitfulness, and that fruitfulness becomes a fullness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just think we're doing some things wrong that we just need some, you know, we don't need a big adjustment, just need some slight adjustment. Just, here's the word of the Lord, I hear this so strong. If you be willing and obedient, I could say to Krista, Krista was always this way, Bless my darling daughter. I say, Krista, now you got to clean up your room. And she would argue and fuss. And she would go and she would be obedient, but she was never willing. You could put that child in a chair and you could look at her and I guarantee you she's standing up on the inside. She's sitting in her body, that little body sitting there. But I guarantee you this, she's standing there. You look at her face, she's standing put her down she's standing if you be willing see she was obedient and not willing now Anthony on the other hand you go in his room and uh, you say boy this place needs to be cleaned up I know daddy I'll get it just as willing I'll get it I said alright now I gotta go and I'll be back at 4 o'clock I want this room cleaned daddy it'll be clean come back 4 o'clock it's worse you know why you know why cause he's willing and not obedient you see willing is the attitude Obedient is the action. I want to willingly sow, tithe, give. I want to willingly operate this way in an obedience that comes from a willing heart. Now, what did he say? If you be willing and obedient, you shall. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, blessings and favor to you today, Father. How rich, how good, how sweet you are to us. How amazing, how marvelous, how wonderful you are. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being my father. And I thank you that before I asked you, you put Jesus on the cross and forgave me before I had a chance to pray. You gave, forgave me before the foundation of the world. You were moving this way before I had a chance. I thank you for your proactive love, your heart for me that never ceases, your amazing grace that never stops coming, flowing, ministering, manifesting grace and glory. I bless you today, Father. We agree together. Now, there's some in this room, Lord, that have some heart issues. They have some things in their heart. And I pray you'll do heart surgery this morning. Spirit of God, work on the heart. It's delicate. It's intricate. It's very serious, Lord. Work on our heart. I want you to deal with my heart. It's mine and heart. It's mine and heart. This church property being out of debt is mine and heart. This church flourishing, being able to give and sow and bless is mine and heart. Mind and heart. My needs are met. My bills paid. A savings account. All those things that flourish are mine and heart. And I look to my mouth and I listen and I thank you for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. It's mine and heart. It's mine and heart. It's mine and heart. Work on my heart, Lord, to release the generosity and the freedom that you want me to operate in. So agree with me now, a willing and obedient heart. Lord, a willing and obedient heart. Because when the Lord showed me that this morning, I'd never seen that. 
I'd never seen my heart in 1984 on the first Sunday of that, of that year, the first day of January 1st, 1984 was a Sunday. My heart, I stood there. I could see it in my mind's eye just as clear. I could see my grandfather, Michael, on the front seat. I could see Teresa there. I could see the people. They're all looking at me with anticipation, just, just a 20, just to just turn 22 years old. And I stood up and said, folks, we got 83 cents in the bank. And I laughed and I said, we're rich. We're rich. And they gave me a standing ovation. First pastor in the history of that church that got the bills paid and started out a year. Seven-year-old church. The first time they'd ever started a year with any money to the good. And there have been some times when I look lately and, you know, if you, if you watch the stock market, my father had invested some stocks from my mother and, man, money gone down stocks brother Glenn he knows some stuff about stocks he's telling me they gone as low as they can they went lower the other day Glenn. <laughs> they went down um, and I start thinking here goes 30 33 34 thousand dollars God help me and you start to worry of God need to and the Lord said what are you doing what are you doing what difference does that make to you I'm your father I got all the money we need you just need to come how to learn to get it from me let it flow to you. You just need to come to me. And I'll take care of that. I'll take care of your mother. I'm taking care of all that. That's not your place. Your place, trust me. And how easily we drift. So don't let your heart drift. Father, we set our hearts in agreement to believe your word. To believe our salvation. We agree with your salvation. And we are blessed and favored. We are filled and free. We are full financially flowing. Finances are moving. Finances are moving freely. And we give you the glory and the honor and the praise. And with all reverence, we do say, in the name of Jesus. Blessed be your name, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we said together, amen. It was mine and heart. Look for your manifestation in your mouth. I love you. This altar's open if you need prayer. We had a great day. I'm not sure whether we got the live stream or not. I think we had some technical difficulties. But thank you for sitting in the center section. And if we did, we'll let you know. If not, we'll have it up and running by Wednesday. We tried. Praise God. Thank you. I appreciate you. Great time today. If you'll take this, it'll change your life in Jesus' name. God bless you.